running with giants. Um, I'm really excited this morning because I get to continue the series Running with Giants. I know last week Pastor Eileen spoke on Esther, and I believe that was a setup. Do y'all remember that message last week? I believe it was a setup for today. Uh, because this morning, I want to also talk about the giant Esther, because I believe that there is a spirit of Esther that us as the church has to catch in a new way this morning, amen? There's a spirit of deliverance, there's a spirit of restoration that I believe the church is on the brink to even catch more um, right now, right here, and it's a word for this generation. And so I want to speak to that this morning again and basically do part two of the giant Esther. So if you have your Bibles, your notebooks, you can get them out. We're going to be in Esther chapter 4. And again, I believe it's a word for the church and to quote the book of Esther for such a time as this. I believe the story of Esther and the spirit of Esther literally uh, were speaking this message for such a time as this. So we're going to be in Esther 4 verse 16. I want to even focus specifically on the letter that Mordecai sent to Esther to call out the giant that was inside of her that she didn't even know was inside of her because Mordecai sends Esther this letter and is saying, Esther, I know you can do it. She replies, I can't do it. And Esther said, you know what, Esther, you're the one and now is the time and you're the only one that can do it. And I believe this morning there are giants in this room and God has things inside of you and you're the one and you're the only one that can do it. You're the only one that could be the Esther to your family, to even in this nation right now and in our generation, there are things inside of you that God is calling on. And so we're going to read this letter this morning and kind of talk about um, the backstory of Esther. So let's start in verse uh, 16 right here. Uh, Esther chapter 4, it says, go gather together. I'm sorry, let's start in verse 14. It says, and he sent back the answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at a time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther replied to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So I'm going to just kind of give a little backstory of Esther. We heard some last week, but it's, this is a story of deliverance. It's a story of redemption, but it's also a story of deception. It's a story of scheming and corruption, and it's a story of a turnaround and God using his people to make a difference, to save a nation. It's a story of a young girl who is a Jew who becomes queen of Persia, and at that time, that was unheard of. If you weren't a Persian, you couldn't be queen of that nation. But a Jewish girl who is an orphan becomes queen of Persia. And at the same time, there rises up a advisor of the king named Haman, who rises up and has an agenda and and a vendetta against the Jewish people against God's people. And Haman wanted them gone. He wanted them annihilated. He wanted them killed. And he deceived the king into signing a decree to kill the Jews. And so we find ourselves where Esther is, is a Jew herself. And her, the spirit of God in her and the spirit of Esther has to rise up. So real quick, I just want to talk about seven attributes of the spirit of Esther, what she did to position herself. And these should be attributes of us as the church. Amen. As the body of Christ, we should look like this. This should be attributes that we're using on a daily basis. And so let me go through these uh, seven attributes real quick. You can write them down, but I'm going to go through them pretty fast. Number one is Esther focused on others. She didn't put her focus on herself, but she put her focus on on others. She listened to her leader. Esther listened to her spiritual leader. When Mordecai called on the giant in Esther, she arose. Esther um, had to move out of her comfort zone. Esther had to let God promote her. She had to let the favor of God promote her and not have to just try and do it herself. Esther had to be willing to confront some things. Esther had to face 
things afraid. And she had to be willing to step into the favor of God that was right in front of her. You see, Esther, when she was in this particular story, in this story, you see the favor of God all over Esther. When it comes to all the other women that were being picked to be queen, Esther actually had the most handmaidens. She had the best room in the house. God was setting it up for Esther to be able to become queen and to be able to deliver a nation. There was a setup going on through the course of her life. And I believe God has put favor in in your life to call on the giant in your life as well. And I believe sometimes there's favor that's right there, right in front of us, and all we have to do is step into it, but we hold off sometimes saying, no, that's not for me. No, they want that, and so I can't step into it. But God says that favor is right there, and the favor is for a purpose. Your position is for a purpose. It's to bring glory to my name. And some of you have to just step into that favor and just say, I'm going to take the responsibility, I'm going to take the commitment, and I'm going to take that position because my position is for a purpose. It's for a God purpose. And so I believe as the church, we have to be willing to rise up in the face of fear and rise up in the face of confusion with the spirit, with the response that Esther had. And so um, I just want to even talk about in just a minute the response that Esther had to Mordecai. Because there's another spirit that is knocking on our door today, and that is called the spirit of Haman. Because it's knocking on your door, and it's nothing new. It's been around for centuries, and it's going to stay around. But the spirit of Haman is a spirit of lying and deception and manipulation and corruption. You know, Haman made the king think that he was doing the king a favor by killing the Jews. That's what Haman was so good at deception and manipulation that he had the king sign something the king didn't care nothing about just because his agenda was unholy and unrighteous. He wanted God's people off the face of the earth. And the ways to recognize the spirit of Haman is it hates God and it hates God's people. Number one, it'll always be against what God is for. God is for you. God is for his people. God is for prayer. God is for the church. God is for the body of Christ. God is for so many things. And the way to recognize the spirit of Haman in your home, in your school, in your community, in the nation is to say, it'll always be against what God is for. And it's always against God's people. Number two, it has an unrighteous, unholy agenda. And it's been around for centuries and it has not stopped. And the thing about Haman is we cannot let deception have the final say because sometimes manipulation will try to rise up in your family from another source and this and that, and you have to bring truth to your kids. You have to bring truth to your husband, to your wife. You have to bring truth to it because the spirit of Haman, like I said, is always going to try to rise up and make it look a certain way when it's really not that way because there's an unrighteous, unholy agenda behind it. Haman made it look like he was the king's best friend. He had his best interest at heart, but there was something on the back side of it. But can I tell you this morning, there's good news because the spirit of Esther rose up. And when Esther was called upon, she answered the call. And this morning, can I say, spirits of Esther, this morning you're going to be called upon. And can I encourage you to rise to the call because we can all become more like Esther and respond the way she responded even stronger because the church is called to be the church. Now, even more than ever, the church is called to be a city on the hill, a light to the world, and a place for restoration, for redemption. And it's not just going to happen because we just always do the same thing the same way. Sometimes we have to step into something. Something even newer and stronger. Just like Amanda said it a minute ago, something new. So this morning, I'm going to read a letter to you to call out the giant inside of you. It's, the, it's the, from Mordecai. I'm going to read you a letter from Mordecai, and I'm going to put it in today's terms, in layman's terms. If, if he wrote this letter to you instead of Esther, because how many of you know we live in a time where God's people have to be the giants? God has called them to be. So I'm going to start this letter off like any, any formal letter, dear, and then put your name in there, okay? I'm going to say Sarah because that's my name, but dear, and then in your mind, put your name in there. So, dear Sarah, don't think that just because you're comfortable now in the palace, you're the only Christian when the spirit of Haman rises up will get out free and clear. If you persist in staying silent and do not act at a time like this, God will bring deliverance another way. But by that time, 
you and your family will have perished. Who knows? Maybe you were put here and now in your position in Huntsville, Texas at Family Faith Church for such a time as this. And I believe that God is, that is Haman calling on the giant inside of you for such a time as this. And I want to go, uh, I want to look at Esther's response to what Haman said because, I'm sorry, not Haman, Mordecai sent because that should be the response of the church. The same response is what we should have at a time like this. Can I say this for your family, for your calling, for your marriage? Because there's a spiritual destiny God has for you in your job, at your home, in your work. It is for you. For your children, parents, you only have a certain amount of time to be the Esther to your children. And respond the way God has called on you to be. It's not just let it happen. You know, I look at my parents' life and I, I think, you know, so many things just happened when I was a kid. You know, oh, we just didn't go to that place. Oh, we, we just had these influences in our life. No, they set it up to say this is the people you're going to look up to. They didn't have to even tell it to us. They did it by their actions. Yes, you can go there, but you can't go here. Yes, you can go to Amanda's house all the time, go worship with Amanda, go, because they knew that she was always going to bring an influence in our life that was a godly influence. Not just convenience, because sometimes we can get into such a mode where we just want convenience in our life, and it's okay because it's convenient. We can't have just convenience. We have to stand up and say, you know what? I'm going to make sure that I'm not just looking at things a certain way, but I'm rising up and seeing the whole picture like God sees. So right this morning, I want to talk about how Esther responded. You know, even the other day, I was just looking through social media, and man, it gets me grieved because we live in a time that we never thought some of these things would happen. We never thought we would see some of these things. Who would have ever thought a, 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 a pandemic would take place in 2020. I mean, we're wearing masks. I see masks in here this morning. You guys are awesome. I should have brought my mask too. I should have showed you guys. There's some creative masks out there. Who would have thought the United States, you, to go in a place, you had to put a mask on? We live in unprecedented times. And it's not just a time to be silent. And it's just not a time to be apathetic. This is a time to be an Esther. And the church has to be the church. So how did Esther respond? This needs to be our response because there's giants in the room and God is calling on you this morning. How did she position herself? How did she respond for breakthrough? And we're going to talk about the three F's that Esther responded with. If you have your notes, you can put down the first point and that is Esther, number one, shifted her focus. Esther focused. She shifted her focus because, see, Esther at this time was in the palace, and her focus was on all the palace things. Because even whenever Mordecai came to the gate to grieve, she said, why is Mordecai out there grieving? What is wrong with him? Go tell him that he's making me look bad. That's literally, she sent her, her handmaiden to go say, hey, tell Mordecai to stop wearing those ugly clothes and stop crying. And Mordecai sent back the letter and said, do you not know that there is an agenda against you and your people? Do you not know that there has been something sent out and it's causing destruction for you in your life? Do you not know you've been so busy thinking about yourself in the palace and focus on palace things that you don't even see the grieving people that need your help? And she shifted her focus. She said, I have to change the focus of what I'm focused on to change the direction that I'm going to walk. Because there is a term in, in driving called targeted fixation. It's a term that they use, and it basically, targeted fixation is you steer and the direction that you're focused on. The way you're focused is the way that you start to turn and the way you start to steer. And a way to kind of describe this is we just got my daughter, uh, Brecklin, a little four-wheeler. And... Um, Y'all, she's only two. So we're teaching her how to steer. We probably, this is probably, a, it's like a six and older toy. But, you know, it's okay. We, we got a little overconfident. So we put her on this full wheeler, and we noticed she couldn't steer very well. So we got a bungee cord, and we bungeed the full wheeler to a pole that was sticking up. And then she would just have to drive around in circles. So as she went, this, the full wheeler would just go in circles, and it, went, it just kind of kept going in circles. So we're like, okay, she's good at this. Like, this girl's got it. So we took the bungee cords off, and we're like, you have this whole field, baby girl. Go for it. Drive. You know, there's nothing that you can hit, except we were in the camper, which was behind us. 
And that girl starts going forward. And then because we're behind her, she starts turning and focusing on us. And she goes full throttle right to us. And we're telling her, turn around, turn around. But she's fixated on all the people jumping up and saying, turn around. And she, <laughs> I shouldn't tell you all this story. This is a bad parenting story. But, um, but I'm going to tell you anyways to make my point. Her, the four-wheeler, act like this is the camper. The four-wheeler goes right under the camper, and she just comes flying off the back. And thankfully, we were right there to catch her. But she was fixated on us and wasn't, even though she was going right into the camper, she couldn't help but steer that direction even though there was destruction right there. And um, she's okay now. The bruise has now healed. No, no. But, uh, but there's a thing. It's targeted fixation. The direction of your focus ends up being the direction that you go and the direction of your life. If you're focused on the wrong things, if you're focused on what people did to you or what people are doing, that's going to be the direction of your life. Victim mentality will be the direction of your life. So what are you focusing on this morning? Where is your focus? Is your focus on winning souls? When you go to the grocery store, is it on loving people, building a godly community for you and your kids? Do we have the heart of God on our radar and in our focus? Because I believe if Esther was more in communication with Mordecai, which I believe almost represents the spirit of God calling on the giant in Esther, if she was more close, closer to the spirit of God, she would have known something's off. And I need to find out what's going on. I need to rise up. See, Esther shifted her focus from the palace to God's people. She shifted it from her to others. And sometimes we can just be so focused on the wrong things. Ministry leaders, can I tell you, sometimes we can be focused on the actual doing than the actual ministering. God wants you to enjoy ministry leader, uh, ministering. Praise and worship leaders, God wants you to enjoy the presence of God, not just all the other things. Youth leaders, God wants you to enjoy reaching out to kids and focus on the ministering as well, even though you got to deal with all the other stuff, all the other craziness. But he wants you to enjoy it. He wants you to enjoy parenting. He wants you to enjoy and focus on that and not just all the things that are wrong. He's saying, I want to shift your focus. And so she went to God and she focused on his mission. Now we want to go to point number two. What did she do after she shifted her focus to God? What did she do right after that? And I believe this is something for the church today. Number two, the second F is she fasted. Fasting and prayed. I mean, fasting and prayer. She fasted and prayed. I want to read from Esther 4, verse 16. You can turn with me there if you have your Bibles. So Esther said, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. You know, almost every move of God started with prayer and uh, earnest prayer and fasting. Almost every revival started with fasting and earnest prayer. And you say, well, you know, fasting, you know, we're... I kind of don't hear it very much. You know, fasting is a, something in the Bible that has been recorded all throughout the Bible. Almost every single giant you're going to hear about fasted. I mean, Moses, after a 40-day fast, he received the Ten Commandments. Daniel, after a 21-day fast, God blessed him with wisdom beyond anyone else in the empire. Hannah fasted and received her son. Ezra fasted. Elijah fasted. Nehemiah fasted. Joseph fasted. Joel fasted. Solomon fasted. It's a big deal in the church. It's a big deal in your life because it's not just an Old Testament thing. Jesus fasted before he started his earthly ministry. Peter fasted on a roof. Paul fasted. And Esther called a corporate fast to save a nation. And so can I tell you that that was Esther's response? She goes, she goes, Mordecai, after all this, you're asking me to possibly take my life. Here's my response, fast. That's my response. It doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound all exciting or great. But this is what's going to start to create change. Because the biggest change agent on the planet is prayer. 
It's not just saying something. It's not the only thing you can do. It's the best thing you can do. Whenever you're in a situation and you don't know what to do, the best thing you can do is pray. The first response should be prayer. When there's sickness, the first thing you should do is pray. When there's issues in the marriage, the first thing you should do, God, help my husband, help my wife. What can I do? I'm going to go to you first. It's not just all I can do. It's what I should do. And can I tell you, when you couple that with fasting, that's when things just start to shift and move. Because what it does is it shifts it from me and a fleshly driven desire to what does he want. That's when he can really, we let our ears open up enough to speak. We start, we stop just consuming and we start contributing and saying, God, what do you want? And I want to play this video real quick. It is an earnest prayer to God, and I believe coupled with fasting, earnest prayers like this is what we need to pray. I think they have the video, and I want to just show this to you guys. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. See, prayer and fasting is not looking for a solution. It's being the solution. Right there, you see a woman standing on her knees, being the solution. That's the way God has called us as the church to win spiritual battles and warfare. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and natural, but they're mighty in the pulling down of strongholds through prayer. This is how we win. This is how we are Esther's. This is how the spirit of Mordecai is quenched through a spirit of Esther that says my response is going to be prayer and fasting. That will be my first response. Then I'll see what God says after that. Not just what my mind comes up with, not just what people tell me, not just what I see, but what is God saying? I want to get in a position of standing on my knees where I can hear him long enough to know what's really going on because I'm in the, I might be in the palace right now and focused on palace things and there is conniving and the spirit of Haman rising up in the palace. I don't even know what's happening, but if I can stand on my knees long enough, then I can hear what God's saying and I'll know exactly what to do. That's what, how God calls us. That's how God calls us to stand. I think back even to the start of the, this local church, Family Faith Church, Nanny, she was a woman who stood on her knees, her pictures in the prayer room, because she was literally helped birth one of the first Holy Ghost churches in this city. She stood on her knees. That's what she did. And she was a woman of fasting and a woman of prayer. She said, I'm going to be the solution. It's not looking for a solution. That's being the solution. It's putting yourself on the offense and saying, I'm not going to be reactive, but I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to initiate. I'm going to initiate the change I want to see. And I just want to encourage you this morning. You might, maybe there's something that you want to do. Of course, pray, but maybe you want to fast with your family. If there's something going on if in your family, if in your school, if in your world, you see a spirit of Haman rising, maybe that's something God is calling you to do. And you, the way you, for you to respond like Esther responded. And number three, I'm going to get to the next point real quick, is she had number three. Because I feel like we can stay on that point for a long time. Because I believe it's a now word. Now more than ever. But the third point is Esther had risky faith. Esther had risky faith. It wasn't just faith. It was faith to the death. It was faith that stood in the face of fear and in the face of death and said that my faith is going to follow God's word in the face of it all. In the face of what my uncle says and my aunt says and other people say and what it looks like, my faith is going to stand in the face of that. In the face of rejection, in the face of expectations, in the face of humiliation like Noah. Noah was building an ark and people were laughing, but he stood in the face of all those things because the thing is, is, is you might say, well, my brother thinks I'm crazy. My sister might be laughing at me, but I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to like, because Esther was a young girl. And there is a, literally a spirit of him. He was the second most powerful man in the nation. And what can she do? What can she do? Sometimes we can think that, well, we have to have faith that's bigger than us. Your faith is bigger than you. She might have been a small girl, but she had big faith. And that's what saved a nation. Not just Esther, but her big faith. Her big step. Because the thing is, is other people may laugh and say, that's crazy and why are you? But no, if God says, believe for healing, I will. 
If God says run your race, I will. If God says witness to your boss, I will. If God says lead your family by example and don't back down and don't just go with the flow, I will. If God says speak the truth, I will. If God says bring your friends into a godly way and if they won't come, then you got to lose them, I will. It's risky. It's scary. But that's faith. Even if it takes all I got. No, that's not English perfect terms, but all I got. Not all that I have, but all I got. Even if it takes it all, Esther said, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. It takes guts. It takes commitment. It takes responsibility. That's what risky faith looks like. It steps in the face of inconvenience, in the face of fear, in the face of uncertainty. When it feels good, when it feels bad, it just keeps on stepping. Because Esther was going through these motions, and and so she stepped into the king's palace, and I didn't die. Okay, so here's the next the next thing I'm going to do. I'm going to take them to a dinner because I feel like this is what God is telling me, and I've I've been on my knees long enough to know what He's wanting and to be in step with what He wants. As a church, we have to be in step with what God wants. So she goes into a dinner, and it's scary there, and she knows she needs to ask for another dinner. And then at that next dinner, she waits and waits, and then she knows she needs to step again. It's faith that just keeps stepping and keeps saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try again. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try again. I'm going to keep stepping through inconvenience, through all these other things. Though, even though people are laughing, even though people are, I'm intimidated by them and they don't want me to step, I'm going to keep stepping. You know, even with, I, I think back to my grandpa when he, um, my dad's real dad in Missouri, you know, it was a, a struggle for him to get saved. But we kept believing and we kept stepping. My dad, every two years, drove us to Missouri because he knew that we would be the only godly influences on his life. And you know what? We stepped year after year when it was inconvenient, when it wasn't fun, when we slept in a bed with spiders, and we were all crying, okay? All of us were crying, don't make us stay in the the spider bed. No, you're going to. we stepped and we stepped and we stepped and we just were us and we just loved and we continued to love. And can I tell you, on his deathbed, he gave his life to Christ. He humbled himself enough, even though people say his heart's, his heart's too callous and he's too, too reliant on himself to humble himself enough to come to God. He came to God. He broke down and he accepted God. Can I tell you that if God says it's going to happen, I'm going to believe and I will. I will take that step. I will take that step of faith. And can I tell you that family faith church is full of risky faith takers? Because I know I'm looking at Esther's right now and I'm looking at people rising up to be more like Esther's. This church is full of risky faith that stands in the gap and that does not break down when things get hard. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you want to break the back of the enemy or his plan, couple your faith with focus and fasting. Couple your risky faith with focus and fasting. And you're going to literally, it's something that rises up and takes down the spirit of the enemy or takes down the spirit of Haman, of corruption and manipulation, because you're so in tune with what God's doing. Because the enemy is only there to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come to bring life. He wants you to live an abundant life. And so I encourage you this morning to throw the response of Esther and the spirit of Esther at anything that tries to rise up. Reground your focus. Reground. Say, what do I spend my time focusing on and thinking about? And maybe you want to call a fast and change your normal routine up, routine up and make room to see what God is saying exactly what he's saying. Not just what we're thinking, not just what we're hearing, but what is God saying? And have big, big Bold faith. Risky faith is faith that doesn't quit when it gets hard. And it believes when it doesn't seem like it's looking good. It still believes. If God said, I will. If God said in his word, I will. It steps out when no one else wants to step out. And so I want to encourage you to gear up and the church to stir up and get ready for such a time as this. To focus on the things of God that matter. Focus on loving people, being a beacon of light, serving, teaching, helping, standing, praying, standing in the gap. That's what we're called to do. Not be apathetic, but be stirred. We live in a time and every Christian, every church, the body of Christ has to be Esther's. We have to stand and know that we can rely on God. 
that we can't rely on ourselves. You know, Esther did not go to Mordecai and say, tell the Jews to fast. She said, tell them to fast, but me and all my friends, we're fasting too. Because I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to know I, just because I'm the queen doesn't mean I'm good enough to hear God perfectly. I need to humble myself and fast too. I need to humble myself and hear from God. I might be on the top, on the throne right now, but God, I have to go into the presence of the king of kings before I go into the presence of the king because I have to hear what he's saying first. And so I want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you this morning that we want to carry the spirit of Esther even stronger, now more than ever. And I want to encourage you this morning that I believe God is putting this mandate and this word on the church. I don't think it's by accident that it was spoken last week. Literally, when I sat there, a mom said, I'm talking on Esther. I, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I had already for weeks, I was like, the spirit of Esther it is something that we need. And when I heard that letter being read, and I might read it just one more time. I might read it just one more time. When I heard that letter being read, and when I was reading, and, I, and it's, it, it struck me so hard. And I'm going to read it in the layman's terms to you guys. Got to find it real quick. Okay, put your name right after the dear. Dear Sarah, don't think that just because you're comfortable now in the palace, that you're the only Christian who in the spirit of Haman rises up will get out free and clear. If you persist in staying silent and do not act at a time like this, God will bring deliverance from somewhere else. But by that time, you and your family will have perished. Who knows, maybe you were put here and now for such a time as this. Maybe you were put here in your family raising these kids in this area in Huntsville, Texas for such a time as this. Can we catch the spirit of Esther more? Can we get closer to it? Can we get stronger in it? Can we rise up in it? How did she respond to that? And I believe that should be our response as the church. Amen. I want to pray real quick and just pray over us as a congregation and a stirring to happen. And so, God, we come to you this morning and we say that we're not good enough that we're not smart enough, that you know all and we humble ourselves and stand on our knees and say we need you in our family and in our world at a time like this. We need wisdom from the Holy Ghost. We need wisdom from God. And we pray, Lord, that you rise the spirit of Esther up in your body and in your church and in your people and in the dads and in the moms, that the spirit of Esther will rise up to take charge, to have risky faith, to focus on the things they should really be focusing on and to fast and pray when they don't know what to do. The best thing to do is to pray and to fast, that we will just like the woman on the video stand on our knees and say, we need a move of God. We need God. We aren't good enough. We're not smart. We're not queen or king enough. We have to go to the king of kings. He knows what's best. And I thank you, Lord, for your people. This morning, God, I pray, Lord, that you bless them. And you give them the favor that you gave Esther, God. That they'll step into that favor and not back away because it looks scary or it looks hard or it looks like a responsibility. But they'll step into the favor because their favor is for a purpose. And I thank you, Lord, for the things that you're doing in their life. Lord, shift our focus to what you want us focused on. In Jesus' name, amen. As you stay in an attitude of prayer. Like Sarah was talking about her grandfather, who they went years after years to go and minister to. They understood that they did not want him to pass through this life without experiencing the salvation of Jesus. So, online audience, people in the audience as well, as we stand in attitude of prayer, I ask you today, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity today. The Bible says that this life that we live is nothing but a vapor. And we know that during this season that life is precious. But I'm here to tell you today, life with Jesus is more than precious. It's priceless. Amen? So, 
that is you, you say, Charles, I need that Savior. I want to live and experience the spirit of Esther in my life. But it all starts and begins with a relationship with Jesus. So if that's you, just bow your heads. If you're online, at home, in your car, wherever you are, just repeat this prayer. Say, oh God, I come to you as I am. You said in the Bible that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I call on you now. I ask you to save me. I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again on the third day for my victory. I make confession with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is now my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. In Jesus' name, if you're in agreement, say amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Online audience, if you made that confession today, you accepted Jesus into your heart, there is a number to the left of your screen at the bottom that we would love for you to text the word CONNECT to. Because pastors Jeff and Eileen, they just want to connect with you through a word of encouragement for the next five days. They just want to share some wisdom and knowledge on how to go forward from this point. Amen.